Millions in Syria and Iraq are facing water shortages as the region's longest river, the Euphrates, dries up. The water level in Venice, Italy is so low that it is impossible to row a boat. In France, it did not rain for more than 30 consecutive days. In the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent turns into a desert crescent, making those who see it in awe. Surely this news has continuously appeared recently, but amid all the drought-related news, the drying up of the Euphrates River has sparked doomsday worries. Because in the Bible revelation, the drying up of the Euphrates River is, like the Zionist Jews, one of the signs of the end of the world. Is the predicted end of the world coming? I invite you to watch until the end of this video to discover the secrets under this famous river, which Ghana shocked scientists. The river is disappearing. The Euphrates River is currently expected to dry up in 2023, and by 2024 we don't know if the situation will improve. Who knows if it will be filled with water again? In just a few decades, flows in the Euphrates River system have dropped to nearly half the average annual flow during dry years. The amount of water stored behind the Euphrates Dam has decreased from 14 billion cubic meters to only 10 billion due to depletion, causing the lake to lose 75% of its effective reserve. The drying up of the river has drawn a lot of attention to it. People are interested in science, geography, society, and at the same time, pay extremely close attention to the spiritual aspect behind it. What happens if the Euphrates dries up? If the Euphrates dries up, at least in Iraq, what will happen next? In this nightmare scenario, agriculture, livestock, and industries dependent on water would wither and die. Millions of people would lose their livelihoods and would not have access to plentiful clean water for drinking and washing. This could lead to mass disease outbreaks, civil unrest, and the migration of millions of refugees into neighboring countries, including Turkey and Iran. War could conceivably result. Burdened with increasing numbers of refugees, Iran might ally with Iraq to destroy one or more of Turkey's dams and release the flow of water. However, because Turkey is a NATO ally, this would obligate the United States and European NATO countries to defend Turkey and go to war with Iran and Iraq. So you can see, this problem is serious enough to wreak havoc not only in the affected countries themselves, but in the world at large. In addition, the drying up of the river also reveals many interesting and mysterious things. Let's see what we found. The Angel at the Euphrates As the sixth trumpet sounds in the apocalypse, St. John, seen in the right margin, hears a voice from the golden altar. The illuminator identified the voice as the Lord's by including the bottom of a mandorla, with the Lord's feet resting on an orb. The voice tells the angel, with the trumpet, to release the four angels who had been bound in the river Euphrates. In the miniature, these four avenging angels rise from the river with their weapons, ready to fulfill their mission of killing a third of the people on earth. And when the river dries up, how will this story unfold? We know that these are demonic beings because they are described as bound. Demons are fallen angels, many of whom are bound in chains of gloomy darkness. God's good angels are not bound, but are free, as are some of Satan's angels, demons. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The region of the Euphrates, where these four angels are bound, has a notorious relationship to human sin. The first murder was committed, presumably, not far from the Garden of Eden in the Euphrates region. You can see this in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. The first war in Genesis 14 Confederacy took place in that region. In Genesis 10, Nimrod began his kingdom, their Babylonian idolatry sprang up in the region and will be judged there. You can find this story in Zechariah 5 and Revelation 18. Some interpret the four angels as symbolic figures representing various spiritual forces 
or destructive powers at work in the world during the end times. They are seen as agents of judgment or instruments of God's wrath. Others suggest that the four angels may represent fallen angels or demonic entities associated with the region of the Euphrates River. This interpretation connects with the idea that these beings are released to bring about destruction and chaos. Certain interpretations propose that the four angels represent actual historical figures or powers, such as military leaders or nations associated with the Euphrates region. This view links the imagery to specific geopolitical events or conflicts. God had planned significant destruction to the Roman Empire that had persecuted the church. That destruction was delayed so that God could arrange for his people's protection. Revelation chapter 9 tells us that even after the damage caused by the releasing of the angels, the wicked did not learn any lessons and did not change. So, it can be said that the depletion of the Euphrates is just one of the signs of his presence. Everything reminds us that God is ultimately in control of these events, allowing or announcing each one. At no point in the end times is evil allowed to run entirely out of control. If the four angels are underneath in the underworld, then that might be the only thing protecting us all. The earth separating flesh from spiritual screams that could drop large groups of spirit flesh beings from spirit beings that can shriek in airwaves and vibrations that are lethal to humans. If that's true, we can't stop it from coming. Four shrieking beasts whose screams would shake the whole earth. Signs of Human Civilization Found The ancient Euphrates River had abundant water, and together with the nearby Tigris River and the Jordan River, the Three Rivers Basin formed a crescent-shaped oasis and was historically known as the Fertile Land of the New Testament. This land can be said to be the largest oasis in the Middle East Desert and is also the cradle of civilization here. Scientists have revealed that life exists beneath this river. Right at the Euphrates River, humanity's first civilization appeared, the Sumerian civilization. Sumer is an ancient civilization that appeared around 3800 BC, founded in Mesopotamia in the Fertile Crescent, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, south of present-day Iraq. Their culture included a group of city-states, including Eridu, Nippur, Lagash, Kish, Ur, and the first city, Uruk. At its peak around 2800 BC, the city had a population of between 40,000 and 80,000 and was considered one of the most populous cities in the world at that time. The architecture of this area is also extremely special when each city and state of Sumer is surrounded by a wall built of flat convex mud bricks. They even made pottery, weaved cloth, built many irrigation works, and knew how to use buffaloes and cows to plow fields before other ancient civilizations such as Egypt and the Yellow River. But this civilization did not last long. In 1940 BC, Sumer was invaded by the Elamites and looted the city-states. Then came the Hammurabi dynasty of Babylonia, the Babylonians unified the lands of Mesopotamia, and the Sumerians perished. By around 1700 BC, the Sumerians were gradually assimilated with the Assyrians and Babylonians. But once the Euphrates River drees up, many things will be revealed. Scientists found signs of the presence of writing, astronomy, mathematics, geometry, and medicine in the ancient ruins left by the Sumerians. Among them, there are many achievements that are still used by modern people to this day, such as the multiplication table, how to calculate area, circumference, or how to perform craniotomy. In addition, the Sumerians also developed many weapons and objects to support their many wars, such as spears, bronze helmets, and carried shields made of leather or wicker, chariots and carts known as combat vehicles. Message about the rivers drying up. Jesus is coming back. You also know this river is extremely important to the children of God. About 4,000 years ago, Abraham followed God's summons from his hometown Ur across the Euphrates River to Canaan. 
Canaan roughly corresponds to modern-day Israel and the western bank of the Jordan River. This is the land God gave to Abraham and his descendants, also known as the Promised Land. The Euphrates River is one of the boundaries of Canaan. The end times have been upon us from the ministry of Christ on. That's 2,000 years of waiting to see if the sun still rises tomorrow. Rather than worry so, let us have faith in what Christ taught. No man knoweth, and it will come as a thief in the night. Those who are faithful will be prepared, not just spiritually for having repented, but physically and mentally. They will be able to do their work without worry and anxiety. The point of these signs is to give us courage and faith, to know that we're on the right course even though the going is rough. Let us not worry about when that great day arrives then, and push forward as though every day is the last, knowing that our efforts will be rewarded accordingly. The Euphrates River is drying up, whether through natural or political causes it makes little difference. What is significant is that John prophesied 2,000 years ago that it would happen as one of the signs of the last days. Believe the Bible or not, it seems to be coming up with some pretty strong evidence that Christ will soon return. Be prepared to meet him. The river flows from the Garden of Eden. While waiting for real signs to happen, let's learn more about this historic river to prepare thoroughly for everything that can happen. Euphrates is the longest river in Western Asia, originating in Turkey, flowing through Syria and Iraq, finally emptying into the Persian Gulf. It has a total length of more than 3,000 kilometer, about half the length of the Yangtze River. River water mainly comes from rainwater and melted snow. The Euphrates is also one of the most historically significant rivers. It appeared in Iraqi cuneiform script about 5,000 years ago. At that time, it was called the Buranun River, meaning sacred river. It later appears in the Bible, centuries, as one of four rivers flowing from the Garden of Eden. The Promised Land of Canaan. The area east and north of the Fertile Crescent is the famous Mesopotamian basin, home to two great rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. Every spring, river water flows in, bringing fertile alluvium to the southern plains. The river has many rich fishery products, and the wide riverbed helps waterway transportation be quick and convenient for trade and commerce. Therefore, since ancient times, the Mesopotamian basin has been the fertile land of the Middle East, and it has also given birth to many ancient civilizations. Ur, Abraham's homeland, and the once glorious Kingdom of Babylon were all located in this land. Egypt, located to the west of the Fertile Crescent, was also a very rich land. Interestingly, in the middle of this land is the Jewish promised land of Canaan. But it is much worse. The Jordan River flowing through Canaan is narrow and short compared to the two major rivers. The land on both sides of the river valley is largely infertile and not favorable for farming. This is strange. Why is God's promised land so barren? Natural water sources in the Canaan area essentially depend on rainwater. Every year around November, there is an autumn rain that moistens the dry land, making it loose and very suitable for growing crops. In March and April of the following year, there will be another spring rain so that plants have enough water to grow, which is also important for having a good harvest. Without autumn rain, the land cannot be planted, and without spring rain, crops cannot be harvested. If the God's people follow his instructions, he will send down two rains at the right time so that the wether here will be favorable and life will be prosperous. If God's words are not obeyed, the two rains will not come on time, leading to crop failure and people's lives will face many difficulties. That is why some biblical scholars say that in the land of Canaan, geography and religion come together and this place is a spiritual classroom arranged by God himself, a place for training, practice, faith. This is why Canaan is called the Promised Land. Only those who listen to God will be cared for by God. The Reborn of Jerusalem After 1400, during the time of King Zedekias of the Kingdom of Judah, the Jews gradually turned their backs on God to the point where God could not tolerate them. 
So God decided to take back the promised land. But God is always merciful. Therefore, he sent the prophet Jeremiah to warn the world to see if there was still a chance for them to stay or not. Jeremiah went to Jerusalem to look around and saw that the whole city was full of wickedness and disloyalty. Everyone, regardless of high or low status, is greedy for unjust assets. People do things that God does not allow to do, such as murder, theft, hypocrisy, adultery, lying. Both prophets and priests are speaking false prophecies, pretending that everyone things are going well. People are naive and don't know anything, but they still love to listen. The more Jeremiah looked, the sadder he became. He ran to the gates of the sanctuary and began to shout that danger was coming from the north, that it wanted to destroy the cities of Judah. But no one paid attention to him. Jeremiah even took the potter's jar and broke it in public, telling everyone that God would also break the people's Jerusalem and Judah. But people still didn't react. Jeremiah prophesied that one day a drought would come with swords and spears and their water supply would dry up. The Medes of Persia will take over their kingdom. The arrogant king of Babylon did not believe it at all. Why? Babylon was built on the banks of the Euphrates River. Since ancient times, the water of the Euphrates River was very abundant. The river rushed through the city, and the people of Babylon never had to worry about water. Besides, the walls of Babylon are famous for their solidity, which can be said to be bronze walls and iron walls. To enter Babylon, there were only two ways, either through the city gate or across the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River's inflow and outflow are securely locked with metal gates. With a defense like that, how can we attack it? However, 48 years later, King Cyrus II of Persia found a way to destroy the citadel. He dug a canal on the Euphrates River to divert the river's water. After most of the digging, he took the rest of the army with him, quickly stationed himself outside the city and waited for the opportunity. And the opportunity has come. That day was the big festival in Babylon. King Belshazzar held a big party for 1,000 ministers. Everyone drank wine happily. Suddenly, a hand appeared on the city wall and wrote some incomprehensible words. Enemy troops entered the city from the muddy bottom of the dry Euphrates River. It turned out that the Persians outside the city had diverted the upper Euphrates River via the canal that night. Downstream, the dry riverbed has become a wide road. The Persian army entered from under the Iron Gate and broke into the city, winning without bloodshed. King Belshazzar was killed that night, and Babylon fell. 400 years later, this once glorious city was completely abandoned. After 2,000 years of sleeping underground, it was not until the early 19th century that it was excavated by archaeologists. It truly fulfilled what Jeremiah had said, from generation to generation no one will be there. After its fall, the city of Babylon was prophesied to reappear. It is depicted as a dissolute woman riding a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. The great red dragon devoured her and then fought the Savior. The Savior sits on the throne like a lamb sacrificing himself for all humanity. The lamb opened the seven seals and the angel blew the seven trumpets. The Savior and his army defeated the red dragon with the sound of a trumpet. Then the angels poured down seven golden bowls filled with God's wrath and the apocalypse had begun. Each falling golden bowl corresponds to a disaster. The sixth bowl was poured into the Euphrates River. After that, the river dried up to prepare a passage for the kings from the east. Who are the kings from the east and what will they do on the other side of the Euphrates? This was not said in the prophecy. After the drought will come the end of the world. It may or may not come. Because after the disaster ends, the new world created by Christ will appear. This is the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. In the new world, there will be no Garden of Eden, nor Adam and Eve. Many of the inhabitants here came from the old world, 
they all passed through the judgment before Christ, and their names were recorded in the Book of Life. The Euphrates River flowing from the old world of the Garden of Eden has dried up, but the water of life flows from the throne of the Savior. The Savior said that anyone who is thirsty can come and drink. But those whose names are not in the Book of Life are not allowed to drink. So for them, the end of the world is truly the end of the world. Because they cannot go to the new world, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. It is happening now. The river has dropped so much, but discovering past civilizations is still exciting. The Euphrates being at such a low level has exposed underwater villages. So what would be the original level of the river, the one that kept those areas flooded, or the one now that has left them uncovered, leaves us with an interesting question. Could it be then that it is returning to its original level? Euphrates is drying up to make way for war from the east, which will be soon. Long, interesting historical monologue of the Euphrates River, and there are still mysteries that need scientists to discover. Let's wait and see.